This is section seven of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax, Advice to a Daughter, Vanity and Affectation. Read by John Greenman. I must with more than ordinary earnestness give you caution against vanity, it being the fault to which your sex seemeth to be the most inclined. And, since affectation for the most part attendeth it, I do not know how to divide them. I will not call them twins, because more properly vanity is the mother, and affectation is the darling daughter. Vanity is the sin, and affectation is the punishment. The first may be called the root of self-love, the other the fruit. Vanity is never at its full growth till it spreadeth into affectation, and then it is complete. Not to dwell any longer upon the definition of them, I will pass to the means and motives to avoid them. In order to it you are to consider that the world challengeth the right of distributing esteem and applause, so that where any assume by their single authority to be their own carvers, it groweth angry, and never faileth to seek revenge. And if we may measure a fault by the greatness of the penalty, there are few of a higher size than vanity as there is scarce a punishment which can be heavier than that of being laughed at. Vanity maketh a woman tainted with it, so top full of herself that she spilleth it upon the company. And because her own thoughts are entirely employed in self-contemplation, she endeavoureth by a cruel mistake to confine her acquaintance to the same narrow circle of that which only concerneth her ladyship forgetting that she is not of half that importance to the world that she is to herself, so mistaken she is in her value by being her own appraiser. She will fetch such a compass in discourse to bring in her beloved self, and rather than fail her fine petticoat, that there can hardly be a better scene than such a trial of ridiculous ingenuity it is a pleasure to see her angle for commendations and rise so dissatisfied with the ill-bred company if they will not bite to observe her throwing her eyes about to fetch in prisoners and go about cruising like a privateer and so out of countenance if she return without booty is no ill piece of comedy she is so eager to draw respect that she always misseth it, yet thinketh it so much her due, that when she faileth she groweth waspish, not considering that it is impossible to commit a rape upon the will, that it must be fairly gained, and will not be taken by storm, and that in this case the tax ever riseth highest by a benevolence. If the world, instead of admiring her imaginary excellencies, taketh the liberty to laugh at them, she appealeth from it to herself, for whom she giveth sentence, and proclaimeth it in all companies. On the other side, if encouraged by a civil word, she is so obliging that she will give thanks for being laughed at in good language. She taketh a compliment for a demonstration, and setteth it up as an evidence, even against her looking-glass but the good lady being all this while in a most profound ignorance of herself forgetteth that men would not let her talk upon them and throw so many senseless words at their head if they did not intend to put her person to fine and ransom for her impertinence good words of any other lady are so many stones thrown at her she can by no means bear them they make her so uneasy that she cannot keep her seat, but up she riseth, and goeth home half burst with anger and straight-lacing. If by great chance she saith anything that hath sense in it, 
she expecteth such an excessive rate of commendations that to her thinking the company ever riseth in her debt she looketh upon rules as things made for the common people and not for persons of her rank and this opinion sometimes tempteth her to extend her prerogative to the dispensing with the commandments if by great fortune she happeneth in spite of her vanity to be honest she is so troublesome with it that as far as in her lieth she maketh a scurvy thing of it her bragging of her virtue looketh as if it cost her so much pains to get the better of herself that the inferences are very ridiculous her good humor is generally applied to the laughing at good sense it would do one good to see how heartily she despiseth anything that is fit for her to do the greatest part of her fancy is laid out in choosing her gown as her discretion is chiefly employed in not paying for it she is faithful to the fashion to which not only her opinion but her senses are wholly resigned so obsequious she is to it that she would be ready to be reconciled even to virtue with all its faults if she had her dancing master's word that it was practised at court to a woman so composed when affectation cometh in to improve her character it is then raised to the highest perfection she first setteth up for a fine thing and for that reason will distinguish herself right or wrong in everything she doth she would have it thought that she is made of so much the finer clay and so much more sifted than ordinary that she hath no common earth about her to this end she must neither move nor speak like other women because it would be vulgar and therefore must have a language of her own since ordinary english is too coarse for her the looking-glass in the morning dictateth to her all the motions of the day which by how much the more studied are so much the more mistaken she cometh into a room as if her limbs were set on with ill-made screws which maketh the company fear the pretty thing should leave some of its artificial person upon the floor she doth not like herself as god almighty made her but will have some of her own workmanship which is so far from making her a better thing than a woman that it turneth her into a worse creature than a monkey she falleth out with nature against which she maketh war without admitting a truce those moments excepted in which her gallant may reconcile her to it when she hath a mind to be soft and languishing there is something so unnatural in that affected easiness that her frowns could not be by many degrees so forbidden when she would appear unreasonably humble one may see she is so excessively proud that there is no enduring it there is such an impertinent smile such a satisfied simper when she faintly disowneth some fulsome commendation a man happeneth to bestow upon her against his conscience that her thanks for it are more visible under such a thin disguise than they could be if she should print them if a handsomer woman taketh any liberty of dressing out of the ordinary rules the mistaken lady followeth without distinguishing the unequal pattern and maketh herself uglier by an example misplaced either forgetting the privilege of good looks in another or presuming without sufficient reason upon her own her discourse is a senseless chime of empty words a heap of compliments so equally applied to differing persons that they are neither valued nor believed her eyes keep pace with her tongue and are therefore always in motion one may discern that they generally incline to the compassionate side and that notwithstanding her pretence to virtue she is gentle to distressed lovers and ladies that are merciful she will repeat the tender part of a play so feelingly that the company may guess without injustice she was not altogether a disinterested spectator she thinketh that paint and sin are concealed by railing at them 
upon the latter she is less hard and being divided between the two opposite prides of her beauty and her virtue she is often tempted to give broad hints that somebody is dying for her and of the two she is less unwilling to let the world think she may be sometimes profaned than that she is never worshipped very great beauty may perhaps so dazzle for a time that men may not so clearly see the deformity of these affectations but when the brightness goeth off and that the lover's eyes are by that means set at liberty to see things as they are he will naturally return to his senses and recover the mistake into which the lady's good looks had at first engaged him and being once undeceived ceaseth to worship that as a goddess which he seeth is only an artificial shrine moved by wheels and springs to delude him such women please only like the first opening of a scene that hath nothing to recommend it but the being new they may be compared to flies that have pretty shining wings for two or three hot months but the first cold weather maketh an end of them so the latter season of these fluttering creatures is dismal from their nearest friends they receive a very faint respect from the rest of the world the utmost degree of contempt let this picture supply the place of any other rules which might be given to prevent your resemblance to it the deformity of it well considered is instruction enough from the same reason that the sight of a drunkard is a better sermon against that vice than the best that was ever preached upon that subject end of advice to a daughter vanity and affectation read by john greenman